your goal, everything should be God's will. I'm gonna give you four reasons why. Number one reason why you should do God's will and you should only strive for this. I think about death a lot, like I meditate upon it. And when I'm with my children and I, I think about what it would be like if I was in a car accident and they were with me and I was dying and I'm looking at their face, I'd be worried about them. Like, I think I'll be okay. I'm worried about what Joseph's gonna do, who, who he's gonna have if he doesn't have me. And then so I, I get emotional because this is, this is at the core of who I am. I would be at peace if he had these two things in his heart above all. That he had a, a passionate desire above all else to do God's will. And if he had the habit of having the sense of the presence of Mary. Those two things above all is what I want for him and for all of you. And if you think about it, that's precisely what God wants for us. When he was dying on the cross and when he looked down, the whole purpose of his death was union with you. And the last thing he did was give you his mother to keep her present with you because he knew that if she was there by your side, you would do his will. And we do a lot of stuff and we promote a lot of things and we have a lot of devotions. But if we don't do God's will, it's all a waste. If we're not following God's plan for our life, it doesn't matter. I don't care how many rosaries you've prayed. I don't care that you spent four hours in adoration and those things are good. But if it doesn't lead you to God's will, why are you doing it? If it's not God's will, if it's God's will that you be with your family, why are you doing that? So if you, and if you look at Christianity, that is precisely what's wrong with the church. That is precisely why in some places it's dead. We're missing out on what is the number one point. Why did Jesus come? If you look at all of the promises that he made, every promise, I can't relate to it in the church that we have today. When he says that there will be streams of living water flowing out of our hearts, I, I feel it in myself. I don't see that in everybody else. When Jesus says, it is better that I leave you. It is better that I die and go away and that you never see my face again, except in the Eucharist, so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. I don't see that living out in the church. I don't see that life that springs out. When, when he says to the apostles, you will do greater things in my name. You will do greater things. Do I really believe that that's true? Or do I make an excuse and say, that's not for me, that's for somebody else? Do I, do I even come up with theological hypothesis of why that is not relevant for today? Well, they needed that in the early church because nobody was believers and they had to, to present the gospels and people had to know that it was true. Guess what? Stop making excuses because that's today. How does all of this happen? In, in one of the, the chapters that really stuck me in the soul, I was meditating upon, it was in Mark chapter 17, where Jesus says, you will know my disciples because, you will know my disciples because they eat poison and it doesn't hurt them. You will know my disciples because they cast out demons in my name. You will know my disciples because, and he gives all of these things that I, Gabriel Nicholas Castillo, cannot relate to. I wanted to know what's wrong with me, what's wrong with all of us. I read the very next verse. And then they went and Jesus worked with them in all of these things when they were cooperating. And then when you look at St. Paul and he says, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. It doesn't matter if you say, Lord, Lord. It doesn't matter if you cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Unless you do the will of my heavenly father, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is only when we cooperate with him and we listen to his voice and we do his will. The way of St. Therese and the way that God wills for us is to say, I can't do it. You love through me. Lord, I can't pick my head up. I'm too in much darkness. You have to pick my head up for me. You have to be nice to these people for me. You have to speak to my small group for me. What do you want me to communicate to my small group? I don't have it. If you think you have it, you don't have it. You have to know I, I'm nothing. I'm a dog. I have nothing. I have only God's will, and I don't even have the strength to do that. I need to say, Lord, you live inside of me. You speak through me. You act through me. You work through me. You love through me. You suffer through me. 
It's so important. I can't do it. And then when you have this understanding, you will understand why I need you to try make at least one holy hour a week. Why I, I wish for you to desire to go to Mass every single day. This is the heart of all spirituality. Say Maximilian Kolbe would make spiritual communion every single hour. If he's trying to do God's will, trying to have a sense of the presence of the Virgin Mary, and he doesn't have the strength, he's making an act of communion with God because he doesn't have the strength and because he needs to, or else he starts messing things up. But even more than that, our dear little flower, she was living at a time in the church when people could not receive Holy Communion frequently, and she fought for it, and she longed for it. Why? Because that is where she had the strength to live and to love, even in little ways, and to embrace people who are annoying. And she needed Jesus in the Most Holy Eucharist. Your goal, everything should be God's will. I'm gonna give you four reasons why. Number one reason why you should do God's will, and you should only strive for this, and you should only strive for your children, and it should drive every point of your conversation. And you have to really truly believe this, because people will say, oh, the kids today are hopeless. They're in drugs, they're gay, they're trans, they're having sex with animals. I don't care. You have to believe this in the depths of your soul. There's no peace without the will of God. Is that true? I believe it's true. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Therefore, you're only searching for peace. That's what you're looking for. And so I want you to have peace. So I want you to discover God's will for your life. That is the preeminent question that should drive everything that we're doing. What is God's will for your life? How can I help you live that? We don't necessarily always have to preach it. We can just ask questions. And how does that make you feel? Do you feel empty at night? How does this, you, you know what I mean? Where is this relationship leading to? So why should I be striving to find God's will? Because I have a hole in here that is only at peace when I am finding his will for my life, when I am following it. And it's not pretty. It's not easy. If you just look at the people who are the most important to us in the spiritual life, the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, God's will for their life was not pretty. The most perfect of all women had to carry a child, even though she's a, a, a virgin and supposed to be getting married, this would put her as an ostracized person in her community. And that is going to be you. St. Joseph wanted something. He wanted to have the most beautiful wife, which he did, but he wanted to have a normal marriage. He was shocked when this happened. But he chose God's plan. And he had peace of soul. And we honor him for that. All of the apostles who were martyred, they could have had an easier life. They did what they did, yes, because they saw it, but also that is what gave them peace. That's how they could go to death and know that this is, this is God's will for me. I'm going to do this. This is where I belong. So number one reason why we should be striving to get our children to do God's will and we should every day wake up asking God what his will is and striving to do it no matter how hard the cross is it gives me peace of soul. The second thing is, is it makes you holy. Often we talk about, I want to be holy, you're going to be holy, we should strive for holiness, universal call to holiness. What the heck does that even mean? What is holiness? Union with God. It's very simple. God became a man and died on the cross, not just to forgive our sins, not just to make the church. Why? Because he wants to be one with us. It's a very personal and deep relationship. And our Protestant brothers and sisters, as much as I love them, they have ruined the intimacy of the love of God. Because they say, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And oh, as long as I'm going to heaven, once saved, always saved. God loves me more than that. God loves me so much that he has a specific will for my life. He wants to become one with me in Holy Communion. He wants to forgive my sins in the sacrament of confession. He just, the intimacy and the presence of the love of God is insane. It's unbelievable. It's incalculable. And that's what holiness is. Just do God's will and have him do it within and through you. It's very simple. And that holiness spills out into the lives of other people. And that's the third reason why we should strive to do God's will. It's very important, again, from the Gospels. We need to read the Gospels more. Our Lady goes to her cousin Elizabeth. She does not teach Elizabeth about the presence of God. She does not proclaim to her a theological message. She simply cooperates with the will of God. 
And when she greets her cousin Elizabeth, the scripture says very carefully, you have to read everything very carefully, break everything down. From the moment your greeting reached my ears, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and the child in my womb leapt for joy. Did the Virgin Mary preach to Elizabeth? No, not necessarily. She simply went to visit her cousin, to minister to her cousin, and because she was ministering and in union with God, the Holy Spirit sanctified the child in the womb of Elizabeth. He, he was, all sin, we believe, was removed from him at that moment. We have that same effect. I know that there's going to be a desire to like proclaim, and there's going to be a time and a place for that. But simply loving the young people who are in your small group, simply caring about them, that will do it. That will do it. And in your own life, if you have family members who you really, really want to convert, and you're really, really trying to like get them to go to church, conversion does not happen because of words. Sometimes when this, the person's already there, maybe they're, they've got a lot of grace built up, they're a solid Christian, and there's just misconceptions concerning theology, maybe then you can say, dude, just look at the Gospel of John. It's very clear. And you go, doo -doo -doo -doo, and they say, oh my gosh, I've never seen it before. But the usual means of conversion is grace. And that grace flows from two places, prayer and sacrifice. If you think about your own conversion, if you think about your own spiritual journey, if we have faith, we are the fruit of somebody else's death to themselves. Somebody else said, not my will be done, your will be done, and God worked through them, the grace was given through them to change you. Most of you, most of us. Whether that's our parents, whether that's a friend, whether that's a coworker who is cooperating with God's grace, who is saying, I'll, I'll do what God wants this time. And we have to be willing to do the same thing. So number one reason, peace of soul. Number two reason, it makes us holy. Number three reason, the sanctification of other people. Without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt, there are people that God wills to work and to reach only through you. Many of you know my personal background. I went to Elsick High School. I had a woman who has a parent at the same school that my son goes. She brought a picture of me and gave it to my wife. And it was me and like two other dudes from high school. Which I don't even remember because my brain is like, that guy is dead. And I looked at myself and man, I was handsome. And I had blonde hair and it was so sticking up. I used to ask myself the question a lot, why me? Why not Dustin? Why not my friend Idris? Why not Josh? I was doing the same bad things that they were doing, but God chose me. Why? Why me? It is because God has a plan for you to work in other people's lives, and if you do not cooperate, those souls won't be touched. So if you have an appreciation for the great gift that God has given you, you have to cooperate, or there's people who aren't going to make it to heaven because of you. It's because you have to die. That is the essence of Christianity. I die, Christ lives. My will dies. That is, that is the hardest thing to sacrifice. That is the hardest thing to sacrifice. What I prefer. And why don't I do God's will? We're going to get into that in a moment, but just briefly while it's on my mind. One, I'm too attached to my own will. I want what I want, so I don't even want to ask God what he wants. I ask some young men, are you considered the priesthood? Ah, I like women. I didn't ask you that. I love women. Love all of them. I asked, what is God's will for your life? What does God want for you? Do you believe that God loves you more than you love yourself? And that his plan for you will bring you happiness? What is his plan? I don't even want to hear it because I'm too attached of a fake imaginary future that I have in my mind. The other reason we don't ask is because we're too hasty. We'll talk about that in a moment. The fourth reason why you should do God's will. All of these promises from the New Testament are real. They're all real. Jesus keeps his word, the infallible word of God. He says what he means. If you cooperate with him, if you're at the grocery store and you feel the tugging in your heart to pray for somebody and you say to yourself, I can't do it, and he says, exactly, you work with him. You will see the hand of providence. Again, you have to have a sense of the presence of God. 
That's called being recollected. St. Ignatius of Loyola says we should strive to be recollected at all times so that when you do get that tugging, that prompting of the Holy Spirit to say or to do or to be, you can actually do it because you're like, I can't do it. Then you're like, God is here. Thank God. You will see miracles. You will see acts of divine providence. The things that I've seen, the conversions that I've seen, the, I, I, just can't, I just can't put them into words. But you have, you have to cooperate. And you have to have, this is so important, you have to have confidence. We don't trust God. That is, that is at the heart of why we sin. If you look at Adam and Eve in the garden, why did they sin? Can you really trust what God says? Can you really believe that the Father said this? Confidence, confidence, confidence. For example, today's gospel. There's a Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus, says, Lord, have pity on me. Have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon. And it's very clear. Jesus did not respond. Then the apostles say, Lord, get her out of here. And then Jesus says, I've not come for you. I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. And then she persists. So Jesus ignores her. Then he tells her no. And then she persists, and then he does what I love. He says, it is not fitting to take the food from the table and give it to the dogs. That's not a nice guy. I love that. And then she says, so get this straight. This happens to all of us in prayer. What does she have that I don't? Confidence. She gets nothing in prayer. The church tells her no. God himself tells her no. God himself appears to be insulting her. And she says, but Lord... With a lot of confidence, even the dogs get the food that's fallen from the table of the children. And then Jesus responds, this woman's faith is incredible. Go. That very moment, her daughter was healed. Is Jesus a jerk? He's not. He's teaching us a lesson. And he teaches it with practically every miracle that he does. Confidence, 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 confidence. When, when things are bad and you start to diminish, you say, no, my confidence tenfold. The worse it gets, the greater the thing you're going to see. Confidence. And even more, I love Mary more. This is why people are like, why do you love Mary so much? Because she's nice. She's nice. Mary's hidden in this gospel, in this reflection. What is the wom this woman represents the Virgin Mary? She does not say, my son John Paul. Have pity on my son John Paul. He's being tormented by a demon. The Virgin Mary, when you love her, when you give yourself to her, she does not say, have pity on Gabriel for he's being tormented and he's going through darkness. She does not say that. She says, have pity on me. Have pity on me because my son is suffering. When she, when she intercedes for us, she does not say, pray for Marissa or pray for Caroline or pray for Sita. She says, have mercy on me, God, because I am suffering because my daughter or my son is suffering. And it is her faith that kind of takes it and pushes it and pushes it and pushes it and gets the miracle to happen. So when we don't have the confidence, ask the Blessed Mother, Mother, give me your confidence. When you don't have the faith, say, Lord, live in me. I can't, it's just easier when you just have him live in you and you're, she's there and it just, it, things get taken care of. Holiness is union with God. Maximilian Kolbe, my best friend, he put a math equation. Many of you know it, but you need to memorize it. You need to meditate upon it. Capital W plus lowercase w equals S. That's the essence. S is sanctity. If I sacrifice my lowercase w, my will, I sacrifice my will. This is the plus sign, the cross, and unite it to God's will. That's sanctity. But it's a lot easier if you say, Lord, you do it through me. It's perfection. So we know how to do it with a sense of God's presence, Try the best you can to be recollected. Ask the Lord to do it through you. Do it through you. Now, how do I know God's will? This is very important. How do I know God's will? This is very basic, but very important. Number one, what are your duties of your state in life? What should you be doing in the present moment? Do them with the intention of God's will. It is God's will that I grade papers. It is God's will that I go to CCE. It is God's will that I cook this dinner. It is God's will that I clean this butt. Whatever. What you ordinarily do, simply say, I'm doing it for you. That's it. That will, that will sanctify the activity. There's a great book called The Practice of the Presence of God, uh, The Best Rule for a Holy Life by a man named Brother Lawrence. It's like maybe 40 pages. And he says, when I have God's presence, all of the duties that I have to do, I see them very, very clearly as if in a clear mirror. And I have found that when I do them in the presence of God, they're done extraordinarily well. Because I'm giving them to him 
and I'm saying this present is for you, I'm doing this for you, he, in return, somehow puts a special polish on it, and you will find that you will have done it far better than if you're doing it out of self-love or a mere necessity. So how do I know God's will? Very simple, what are your duties of the state in life? But you have to do more than that. If you look at our Lord as the pattern for doing the will of the Heavenly Father, you must, you must, you must pray. And when you pray, listen. So many times we pray and I ask God for stuff. This is why we do not understand Christianity. If I live this kind of life, my life will get easier. Uh, this bad thing happened to me. That means God doesn't love me or God's not real. That's not the point of Christianity. The point of Christianity is not to have an easy life. You pray to hear the voice of God. You pray to have the strength to do God's will. You recognize his presence because you recognize he's present and you don't have to push a button in yourselves because he's present for many, many, many reasons. Everything else, you put God first, everything else works itself out. So when your head is down, stop looking at all the ways, all the bills, all the problems. Just look at the face of Christ and you will have his consolation and he's going to walk side by side with you. All right. The third thing is you need to know consolation and desolation. When God communicates to you an idea, you will get what's called consolations. When the idea comes, when God is speaking to you, you will have a profound understanding. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, before you did not understand, now you just have a certain clarity of mind. Or you have an overwhelming strong sense in the will. So you're praying about something. Should I do this? Should I do that? All the, you're, you're waiting. So the number one thing is we don't ask God because we don't want to know. We've got to get over that. The second problem is we have hastiness. I, wanted, I want to know now. So either we're too hasty to ask because we're in such a rush. So we ask and, or we're too hasty to stop and listen. Lord, what do you want to say to me? So you say, Lord, what is it? Blessed mother, what should I do in this case? Pray Hail Mary, do something to that effect. You'll either get an all of a sudden an understanding in the mind or a certain moral tugging to do a particular act. Sometimes that won't happen. If that does not happen, you say, this is called consultation, where you ask the Lord, so you've already tried the, the mental clarity, nothing. You already tried the tugging of the heart, nothing. Then you say, what would the Lord say in this circumstance? What would Jesus ask of me? So for example, what would my mother want to drink? Because I know my mother well, she wants a tea with light ice, half sweet, half unsweet. So I know my mother so well that I'm not infallible in this judgment of mine, but I have a quasi-certitude. I have a, a pretty strong inclination that in this given circumstance, my mom's going to do this. Similarly, you too can have a quasi-certitude based on your knowledge and understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ that he's going to say this. He's going to say, take up your cross and follow me. He's going to say, do the harder thing. He's going to say, fast instead of indulge yourself. Just because I kind of know the guy from reading about what he tells me on a regular basis. There's a great book that I'm going to give everybody a copy of. And the author says, there's precision in the pen. There's precision in the pen. So when ideas come to you, consolations come to you, if you don't write them down, and if they came from God, the devil's goal is going to be to get you to forget that consolation, to get you to forget that moment of clarity. Because that's what we do. We're in the chapel. An idea comes. We're worried about something. The consolation comes. I'm no longer worried about it. Then I leave the chapel. The, the devil says, yeah, but can you really trust God? But the bills are due next week. And then all oh, I'm, I'm back in the head game. I'm back, in the, I'm back in the mental problem. You have to write things down. When you have a consolation, when you feel God is saying something to you, write it down, write it down, write it down so you don't forget it. The devil lives in the past and in the future. God's will for you, he's not going to necessarily tell you the future. He might give you hints as to what the future might hold, but he's not going to tell it to you. Why? Because if I knew with certain moral clarity what the future was going to hold, where am I going to live? I'm going to live in the future. I'm going to be planning and preparing and thinking about and worrying about. And God cannot give me grace there. God only exists here. St. Therese said, she's a doctor of the church, I do everything in my power to leave my past to God's mercy. When you screw up, and you're going to screw up, I screw up all the time, say, Blessed Mother, bring good out of this. And then forget about it. You entrusted it to her, you're done. When the future's starting to get on your head, in your mind, 
When you're worried, remember I said you have to have confidence? We have an innate human drive in us for self-preservation. And so you're going to worry about the future. I would say that the majority of our mental anguish comes from worrying about the future. When that happens, in the name of Jesus and Mary, I bind you, spirit of anxiety, and you focus on the present moment. God's grace only applies to the present moment. What is your vocation now? What is it right now? Where are you right now? You're not a priest yet. Focus on right now. You're not married yet. Focus on right now. You're not poor yet. And this is what Our Lady will teach you, is that when you're worried about paying your bills, about getting married, about being poor, whatever your worry is, and you actually have this one-on-one conversation with the Virgin Mary, she's going to say to you, I've got you right now. And you say, but, but, but in the future, I might go poor. I might not be able to do this. I might not have children. I'm getting too old. I'm whatever. What if I'm not called to become a priest and I go to seminary right out of high school and then I'm going to be screwed? Shut your mouth, devil. I'm living right here, right now, making one decision at a time. The present moment is all you have. You don't even know if you're going to live till tomorrow. The present moment is where grace is. The great saints would say that there's an eighth sacrament, and that's love in the present moment. What is God's will in the present moment? If you, I give you my word, I give you my word. If you do God's will in the present moment, tomorrow is going to take care of itself, and you will find the grace. Every time I've ever worried, and I've, I've, trust me, I've worried 10 lives away because I worry about the future so much. Every time I've ever worried and then said, no, screw it, I'm facing right here face to face. The eyes of the Virgin Mary are on me. I'm going to live right now. Whatever it was that I was worried about never happened. It never happened the way I imagined it. It always turned out 100 times better than I could have ever imagined. In the present moment, you will see the face of God. In the present moment, you love God. The future does not exist. The past does not exist. God's will in the present moment, with God, with love. All right, let's conclude in prayer. Sorry, Blessed Mother, and with Mary. Don't forget Mama. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Mother, we need you. Walk with us every day. Walk with us at every moment, second by second and inch by inch. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.